Little Idiots. I'm Katie Halper. And I'm Mary Mate. How are you, Katie? I'm good. You? I'm well. I'm well. I actually, I saw one of our friends, two of our friends, two friends of the show last night uh, in person. Well, one in person, VJ Prashad and Noam Chomsky. They launched their, I guess this was the North American launch of their book, The Withdrawal, which we uh, had each of them on separately to talk about. Very good book. Highly recommend it. And so they did a really great event at the People's Forum here in New York City. And, uh, you know, it's a huge accomplishment that Vijay Prashad manages to make Noam Chomsky laugh. Wow. There was yeah. a Chomsky chuckle. A Chomsky chuckle. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Chomsky wow. is funny and sarcastic himself, but he doesn't laugh that much. But uh, it was a great chat. And I think it's on their their website. So you guys should check it out. We can put a link to it in the description. Yeah, he'd be a really uh, tough comedy uh, producer. You know, like the stories from Saturday Night Live where Lorne Michaels, whenever there's an addition, Lorne Michaels never laughs. You know, it's kind of, so Chomsky's kind of oh, the same way. Oh, interesting. Never laughs except for Vijay Prashad. Yeah. Who could have yeah. imagined how great he could have done at SNL. Well, VJ did a really funny bit on our show a few weeks ago when he talked about how Jordan Peterson yeah. needs a hug. Yeah, he does. Yeah. That was really funny. People yeah. loved it. They ate it up. Make sure you become Substack uh, subscribers, usefulidiots.substack.com to hear all of the gems from VJ Prashad, as well as Noam Chomsky. Yeah. And we're so, Katie, secure in our com comedy that we don't mind when a guest is funnier than us. No, we and like it. No better uh, challenge for us today on that front than our guest, Kurt Metzger who is a very funny comedian and writer. And he'll be joining us to talk about many interesting topics in the yeah. world of comedy. All right, so should we get to it, to our four basic food groups? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. All right, so Democrats suck. For Democrats suck, I got them suck. Let's see what we got here. Okay, this is a good one. Hundreds of farm workers went on a 24-day march to Sacramento, which spanned 335 miles, and they did that to demand that California Governor Gavin Newsom support legislation that would make it easier for farm workers to cast their ballots in union elections by uh, mail, and it would also protect them from retaliation, and was organized by the United Farm Workers Union. And... Newsom said he would veto the legislation, and that's already great, right? That's already a great Democrat suck. But what makes it even better is that he announced the veto the same day that the wine company he co-founded with the billionaire Gordon Getty announced it had just purchased a $14.5 million vineyard in Napa County. Gross. I've never heard of Gordon Getty, but he sounds like a billionaire. If you were to yeah, ask me, it sound like a, yeah, a that's villain. A, a, yeah. a villain. That's a new word. That's a billionaire villain. A billion. Boom. Boom. You made that up on the go. spot. That's good. A villain. Yeah, I like spot. that. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Trademark that one. Well, and apparently Newsom is also facing pressure from the fast food industry to veto a new minimum wage uh, measure in California that would raise the minimum wage for some fast food workers to $22 an hour. And apparently, He's leaning towards vetoing that as well if it uh, if it goes through. So he just sucks all around. Yeah. Also, yeah. he uh, just voted down some uh, uh, safe injection sites legislation. He rejected uh, supervised drug use in three California cities, which is very un unfortunate because that saves lives, a lot of well, lives. What I'm drawing from this. Uh, from this segment is that Gavin Newsom sucks. And, and he's probably uh, running for president. He probably is running for next. In fact, he probably will be our next commander in chief. So, oh my God. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, he's getting some good practice in uh, California. By the way, California is like, that's like the birthplace of the farm workers movement, right? Yeah. Cesar Stephen Chavez, Chavez you, know, yeah. you know what I mean? This is, this is, so how can you get away with that? Even politically, from the point of view of like a partisan Democrat, that's, that's crazy. It's awful. He sucks. His hair sucks. We can talk. We can say that because he has hair. That's Aaron's rule. You can make fun of people's hair, not their lack thereof. <laughs> also, you know, what's interesting about him is romantically, previously a partner of Donald Trump Jr.'s current spouse, Kimberly oh, right. Guilfoyle, you know, right. so uh, which would be hilarious if he takes the White House, you know, riding the anti-Trump wave after having this bond forever with trump's son don jr right you know yeah that never goes away yeah all right well so for republicans suck uh we have there's always so many choices but you know the big issue right now is joe biden doing some 
limited student debt relief. And that has made some Republicans go apoplectic. So let's hear from Republican lawmaker Lauren Boebert. Oh, I love her. Uh, how the heck can Joe Biden call America first conservatives a threat to democracy with a straight face and a dry diaper? He's the one who has allowed millions to invade our southern border. He's the one who is robbing hardworking Americans to pay for Karen's daughter's degree in lesbian dance theory. I didn't have the option of studying lesbian dance theory. I would have been very interested in that. Me either. Yeah, sounds fascinating. Yeah. Um, but I, I just wonder how much that was workshopped or whether that was like on the, sp the, like on the spot. Yeah, sounds like it was workshopped to me. Some yeah, Republican you can't get a like, joke that good. Yeah, they're like trading jokes, like you know their stereotype of what like a you know a woke person is. Right. So you know lesbian dance theory. I don't know. I can't. I can't think that way. So I, I can't even think of another good uh, right. fake woke mockery degree. But you know. So yeah, they're mad about that. And then let's hear what Marco Rubio had to say. There's no reform. Let's start with this. I talked about the fact we need to reform student loans. I owed over $100,000 in student loans. The day I got elected to the Senate, I had over $100,000 still in student loans that I was able to pay off because I wrote a book. And from that money, I was able to pay it. If not, I would never, I'd still be paying it, OK? So that's not about, I, I think the student loan thing in America is a big problem. And it's broken. And it needs to be fixed. And it needs to be reformed. So what I'm getting there is all you need to do to pay off your student loan, Katie, and be a responsible citizen is just get elected to the Senate and write a book profiting off of your position in the Senate, and then problem solved. Yeah, I know. I didn't know he was a book writer. Yes, me either. Uh, you know, maybe he can write a book about how to deal with student debt. Well, my favorite reaction, though, comes from Congress member Jim Banks. And this is what he said. Student loan forgiveness undermines one of our military's greatest recruitment tools at a time of dangerously low enlistments. Giving away the game right there. We need to keep people impoverished in debt so that they need to go to the military in order to get an ed a college education. So thank you, Jim Banks, for making plain exactly what the problem is with really the entire U.S. educational system is that, you know, saddling people with so much debt that they're forced to go and do things that they otherwise wouldn't, such as enlisting in the military. Yeah, I do like that he said that part out loud. I appreciate it. And the website, The Lever, uh, David Sirota's website, has some more detail on Jim Banks and other Republicans who are opposed to student debt relief. And this is what uh, they have to say about uh, their own uh, financial ties. In the six years since Banks first ran for Congress, he has taken more than $400,000 from defense contractors, weapons manufacturers, and other major players in the military industrial complex. Corporate political action committees for Raytheon, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, BAE Systems, L3 Harris Technologies, and Ultra Electronics have each donated tens of thousands of dollars to Banks. He now sits on the House Armed Services Committee which oversees the Pentagon and U.S. military. So that's ultimately really the constituency that Republicans are worried about when they say that we can't be providing debt relief because that would be hurting the average taxpayer. What they're really talking about is they want to keep people saddled in debt so that they can help serve the real constituents like the military industrial complex. The kind of point we would make, but they make it for us. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So for that reason, Republicans suck. Indeed. Well, I got this week, I got Isn't That Weird. So for Isn't That Weird, uh, a trailer, the trailer from a, a movie called My Son Hunter. Um, and that was has been released exclusively by Truth Social. Uh, so let's take a look. Uh, you can, by the way, you can pre-order the Hunter Biden movie now and reserve your own copy at mysonhunter.com. But here's a trailer. So I'll tell you what's going down. Do you know who I am? They told me you were VIP. All connected to the government. What kind of a moron forgets to pick up his laptop at a repair shop? You're a Biden. Act like one. Everything he built, his life, I just ruined it all. I want to know everything that's on that laptop that can ruin my erection. My friends, it's time to party! 
evidence, you know. I'm taking control. I'm making appearance and I gotta go. Cause I get them dancing with their hands up. Yeah, I walk in and they go bananas. I'm a bad guy. I'm an artist. And they're cheering my Tell me how I can help you. Well, I don't deserve help. Oh, I'm so sorry. I've been through worse. You're the smartest man I know. Thanks, Dad. I just wish I could smack some sense into you. I'll never forget Corey Bob. He was a bad dude. No joke. Dad, we were talking about suffering. No. I can't seem to find anything but positive stuff on the Bidens. Who's the point man for the foreign policy in the Obama regime? Joe Biden. So it looks like you need a billion dollars. So the obvious next question is, where's Hunter? I can remember getting paid some money, but I can't remember what for. Well, my dad says we never discuss my businesses, period. Or my cunt. What's happening in there? Joe's in on it. Party's over! <laughs> you had everything, Hunter, and you threw it all away. You hope the laptop will take down everybody with you. Get out! China's not our enemy. They're not bad folks, folks. I love my dad, and I just want to make him proud. I am the one who brings in all the deals. I am the one. Witness oh the sensational bombshell, unbelievable scandals, corrupt censors, shocking, true story. My son, Hunter. Wow. Wow. I had not heard of that. That is... Uh... It's quite something. Well, listen, hey, just as Hunter has the artistic license to make, you know, his his art and make a lot of money from it. He's a, you know, a, a huge hit on the art market, apparently. So does these filmmakers have the right to pursue their vision of a uh, <laughs> of a fictionalized version of the Hunter story? You know, yeah. fair enough. I kind of want to watch it now. I'm kind of curious. When uh, when J when the Joe Biden character says, you know, this laptop is going to cost me my election. I yeah. thought he first said erection. It sounded Same. like erection. Yeah. I did too. Yeah. Maybe maybe he did say that. Maybe it's maybe like, it was erection. I, I thought he said erection. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> also, so, why yeah. does he sound like a New Jersey crime boss? Because that's what th these people are. That's exactly <laughs> what they want you to think. Yeah. Well, I don't know about the yeah. New Jersey part. It should have been Delaware part, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, count me in. Count me in for my son Hunter. Yeah. You we know? should watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Do a do a watch, do a watch party. party. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that's weird. That is definitely yeah, pretty weird. weird, right? Okay. So for isn't that terrible? We have something, unfortunately, very serious, which is uh, in Mississippi, there's a huge flooding crisis right now. Uh, and Jackson, Mississippi, which is a majority black city, has no running water for days now. And there's warnings that this will could go on for a while. So uh, Jordan Cheriton of, Stat of Status Quo News interviewed a Jackson resident uh, named Danielle Holmes, and she linked the crisis in Jackson to the policies of the governor of Mississippi, Tate Reeves. Um, I will say that the governor, this is a direct, what we're seeing here in the city of Jackson, as you have stated, is a, di a long, I mean, a direct um, failure of our state government. This has gone on for 20 or maybe 30 plus years, right? Um, I knew that what Jackson had water problems when I came here to Jackson, Mississippi from Greenwood, Mississippi in 1991. It was never safe to brush your teeth or to drink the water. And so now we are here in 2022 and a governor who has um, totally neglected the plight of the infrastructure here in the capital city of Mississippi. And that's Jackson, Mississippi. And so even his um, the governor's refusal to allocate or appropriate funds for infrastructure this legislative se session because he did not trust the black leadership that was leading the city of Jackson, right? And so we keep seeing these racist tent, these extreme um, policies that are being put in place and neglect, extreme neglect that are putting um, uh, over 175,000 people in the city of Jackson in direct harm and danger because of petty politics. And we can no longer afford to, um, play these kind of games with the governor wow well I, that could also be uh that's a really that certainly is terrible and it fits in both uh, it also fits for republican suck it does i mean they often go together yeah they do, and it's yeah. just you know it's just like you can't help but notice that there are all these crises 
in cities in the U.S. with black with majority black residents. And the other, you know, uh, obviously infamous example, which Jordan Ter- which Jordan Cheriton has done a lot of coverage of, was Flint, Michigan. You know, the right. poisoning right. of of that city, and that was under a Republican governor as well, right? So it's just uh, it's. Yeah. It, it's just awful saying Snyder. stuff like this. Keep going. Snyder. Yeah. And and also to pull it together with um, Democrats suck. Of course, Snyder endorsed uh, Biden and Biden's campaign touted that. I'll never forget that moment. And also never forget Obama visiting Flint, Michigan and drinking water out of a cup and saying that he probably had been exposed to lead chip as a kid. Lead chips, lead paint as a kid. That was a that was an all time Democrat suck when Obama did that. Yeah, that was such Took, a low. Barely didn't take a sip, pretended to. And pretended, to, yeah. So, uh, that was oof, man. All right, so those are our Democrat suck, Republican suck. Isn't that weird? Isn't that terrible? What else is going on in the world? There's some new uh, news coming out of well, new revelations relating to the war in Ukraine. Yes. So this was just reported in Foreign Affairs by Fiona Hill, who is a uh, former senior U.S. official, worked under George W. Bush and then came back under Donald Trump and rose to prominence during Trump's first impeachment hearings, which had to do with Ukraine. And she just revealed something in Foreign Affairs that I think is very damning, which is that essentially the U.S. helped sabotage peace in Ukraine early on during Russia's in invasion. Uh, uh, an agreement was reached that could have put a, the fighting to an end. So this is what she wrote. According to multiple former senior U.S. officials we spoke with in April, Russian and Ukrainian negotiators appear to have tentatively agreed on the outlines of a negotiated interim settlement. Russia would withdraw to its position on February 23rd when it controlled part of the Donbass region and all of Crimea. And in exchange, Ukraine would promise not to seek NATO membership and instead receive security guarantees from a number of countries. Her reporting this is significant because she's confirming, citing multiple senior U.S. officials, that there was the contours of a peace agreement between Russia and Ukraine uh, agreed to. Now, what she leaves out in this article in Foreign Affairs is the part we already knew. And I've talked about this a lot, which is that it was reported that Back in March, after Ukrainians and Russians had been negotiating and setting up a meeting in Turkey to finalize an agreement, it was it was negotiated that it was reported that the Ukraine that the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson flew to Ukraine and told Zelensky, "Do not make peace with Russia, and if you make a peace deal that's premised on security guarantees with the West, we will not provide those guarantees for you." So essentially. There's no way you can make this deal work because we're not going to back you up on it with security guarantees. So we knew that part before. We knew that the UK with the US backing, because there's no way Boris Johnson would have done this unless he was told to by the US, sabotaged the chance of peace with Ukraine. What is new from Fiona Hill is that uh, the US knew that there was a peace deal and that actually it was very, very far along. So this wasn't just, you know, the prospect of maybe making peace through further negotiations. This was actually the contours of an an agreement already lined out. So now it's confirmed essentially that the U.S. and U.K. sabotaged peace between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, now we're in, what, more than six months of fighting. Now there's a threat, the ongoing threat of a nuclear disaster with the uh, Zaporizhia uh, nuclear plant being shelled, and this war goes on. You know, the U.S. just approved another three billion dollars for the war, and the, all the talk is of a long conflict. In fact, it was just reported that this the the U.S. military mission around this Ukraine proxy war is going to get its own name, its own official Pentagon name, like like Operation um, Inherent Resolve in Syria or Operation Desert Storm, you know, which is underscores what a U.S. project this is. And instead of stopping it and supporting peace when they had the chance, the U.S. sabotaged it. The U.S. does not care about Ukrainians. If they cared about Ukrainians, they would not have gotten in the way of a negotiation. Tell your friends and family this because people need to know this because people are really feeling sympathetic and a lot of empathy towards ukrainians i mean um this isn't even a lot of people point out that it's you know double standards why them why not people in yemen okay sure but just within just if you want to reach the people who already have a lot of sympathy and empathy for ukrainians just point out to them 
that this government, the United States and the British and the West in general, they don't care about Ukrainians. They care about weakening Russia. Yeah, and they don't care about Ukrainian sovereignty because if they cared about Ukrainian sovereignty, then why are they telling Zelensky not to make peace and basically forcing him to keep fighting? Right. How is that in the interest of Ukrainian sovereignty? And what people will say is that this agreement with Russia would have undermined Ukraine's sovereignty because it would have meant that Ukraine gives up permanently Crimea and also lets go of these uh, breakaway regions of the Donbass where there's been fighting for the last eight years. But look, the counter to that argument is that, first of all, Crimea is gone. Uh, everyone knows that no matter what happens, Russia is not letting go of Crimea. It's the home to its most important naval base. Uh, it's not going back. And in fact, Crimea used to be a part of the Soviet Union, uh, it was gifted to Ukraine uh, in the 1950s. So there's a, you know, there's, and the majority of the population there, according to polls, has long supported being a part of Russia. That's just a fact. And then as for the other parts of, of Ukraine, well, look, this is a point I've, I've made many times, but it's important to reinforce now that we have this news about the sabotage peace deal. Uh, Ukraine could have kept those breakaway regions of the Donbass if they had been willing to implement the Minsk Accords, which were reached in 2015, it would have kept these breakaway regions, which rebelled against the coup government that the U.S. helped install in 2014. Minsk would have kept these breakaway regions inside of Ukraine in exchange for some limited autonomy. But Ukraine refused to implement the Minsk Agreement. And the U.S., instead of putting any pressure on Ukraine to respect Minsk, and to give these territories some limited autonomy and keep them within Ukraine's borders, the U.S. basically didn't lift a finger and let this war continue, let Ukraine and gave Ukraine weapons to continue shelling these breakaway regions. And so Russia's invasion was essentially a very catastrophic and you could say a legal way of ending that war. So the time to for Ukraine to keep those regions was in the last eight years when it was refusing to implement a peace deal that would have kept them as part of Ukraine. And now with Russia invading, it looks like they're gone. But uh, and that's too bad. It's it's tragic for for Ukraine to be to be broken up. But look, the alternative now is accept uh, that this is the reality or continue fighting and sacrifice more people and probably probably lose even more territory. Isn't that terrible? The bonus isn't that terrible. <laughs> yeah. And we also have a stone moment for you. Here's Biden talking about his safer America plan. They're not unlimited. Right now, you can't go out and buy an automatic weapon. You can't go out and buy a cannon. And for those brave right-wing Americans who say it's all about keeping America, keeping America's independent and safe, if you want to fight against the country, you need an F-15. You need something a little more than a gun. No, I'm not joking. Think about this. Think about the rationale we use that's used to provide this. And who are they shooting at? Shooting at these guys behind me. Okay, so this is Biden making a really weird tortured point about gun safety, but he just manages to, it's, I don't know if it's a gaffe, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's so counterproductive because he's just like telling people, he's saying that people who want guns to protect themselves from the government would need F-15s? Yeah, I think he meant to say AR-15, which is an assault rifle, and an F-15 obviously is a fighter jet. Okay. Unless he unless he actually meant to say that, which is- So it was either you know. a gaffe, and he meant AR-15 instead of F-15, yeah. or he was making a very weird point. Either way, yeah. it's a stone moment. Definitely stone moment. Yeah. There's no shortage of those with, uh, no. with President Chief. Brandon. Yeah, Dark yeah. Brandon. All right. We are very excited to speak to Kurt Metzger. He is a stand-up comedian, Emmy and Peabody award-winning writer, producer, and actor. He is host of the podcast, Can't Get Right, and a writer performer on the Jimmy Dore Show. All righty. So let's go to Kurt. Kurt Metzger, thank you for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I didn't realize it was that quick. <laughs> I realized just now, by the way, I, I think I'm like a little jealous of Katie's hair. Like, I, uh, wish, not I wish I had that much hair and maybe in that style as well. We definitely have to do a Photoshop now of you with the hair, with my exact hair. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine? 
Good. Aaron, I think Aaron's a little jealous too, or maybe just appreciative. I mean, I'm not, I'm not bragging. You've said stuff about my hair in the past. It's got some beachy waves to it. Beach, yeah, thanks. And I just, you know, just air dried it. I just air dried it. That's how you know if it's a good haircut or not. If you can dry it, you yeah, just air dry it. No product. I wouldn't know. Yeah, sorry. I think it's the most talked about issue in our comment section on YouTube. It Katie, is, is, about, is your yeah. hair? Yeah. Yeah. Is it really? It's, it's, oh, yeah. It's a lot of, I'm not a big hair guy talking about people's hair, so it right. stuck out to me. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing I don't have any. I'm not. I mean, I, I'm totally I find I, I like when people do it. You know, I think it's nice. It's a compliment. I just realized that, like, what if you had some weird hair triggered issues that could be. That could make it awkward, but I don't get triggered by it, luckily. I mean, it would be obnoxious if you had hair, if you had such great hair, you know, like, yeah, I yeah. didn't feel really oh, sensitive. Oh, I didn't mean to say, yeah, yeah. I meant it would be obnoxious <laughs> to be triggered by hair in general, yeah. But uh, I'm sure there's some people who would pretend to be offended, right? I mean, I'm sure there's some people who'd be like, please don't talk about my hair. I'm I'm, I'm saying some really politi serious political stuff, but that's not well, me. That's not me. Don't worry. I'll tell you, uh, you're thinking of like Jackson Hank or you? No, I'm joking. I think, yeah, right. um, his waves, he must be uh, thinking that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, his waves. I was jealous of his before until I saw Katie's hair. Um, I was at the con, I'll tell you, here's a hair trigger. Here's hair what the hair triggering I've ever seen, but it is severe triggering. My friend Kyle Dunnigan, that I make these sketches with, we were at uh, the comedy store. We we're trying to work, he had to do like an impression for something, so we we're trying to work this bit out. And uh, Bobby Lee comes up and he's like, uh, Bobby Lee's like a shark of finding insecurities on people like oh, and so no. he just cruises up and um he goes he said something to kyle about his hair that wasn't even like a direct insult it was just a, something that suggested it was thinning and like now i've already i've already shed all care about that so he can't get me with that but so kyle who's still hanging on to his lettuce hair uh as soon as bobby walked away i was like I i'm gonna go bathroom and check my hair under the light <laughs> he said to uh. me Randy, he had to go look at his hair under the light wow. <laughs> Lettuce hair, I like that. I've never heard of that. He made it up. He says he's got oh, hair he like did? lettuce. Yeah. That's his own self-esteem insult against wow. himself. <laughs> I mean, I think people more hair than me should be taxed higher, so I don't feel bad for him. Mil yeah, tax, tax million the, hairs. Tax, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, tax the follicularly yeah, I thought rich. about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I'm curious, uh, now that it seems like, you know, everyone's getting back to normal in the post-COVID era, what, what, comedy, what comedy was like during the COVID era, how you adapted to everything being shut down and whether now that things are relatively back to normal, whether things have changed. Also, not to be annoying, but it's not really a post-COVID era, but it's been d declared a post-COVID era. I thought COVID got cured when the when Ukraine invasion happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah, true. me too. Yeah. I just, I, that's the last I heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> there is a direct relationship. You can't argue with results. I mean, not that right. good to evade, but... Oh, wait. So, oh, okay. So, for, I mean, it screwed up. First of all, a lot of clubs started doing these, like, we had to buy whole tables after the pandemic. Like, you can just buy loan payer tickets. I know this because of all the ranting of Jimmy when he found out. Because he's a guy with a lot of, Jimmy's, Jimmy's got a lot of solo ticket buyers coming. You know, if right. I was a ticket buyer, that's what I would probably be. And, uh, yeah, fair so, enough. Yeah. And so, uh, as far as, but like as far as doing comedy, like I probably was doing better during the pandemic. I mean, I guess like money wise, I was doing better during the pandemic, and that's without. I was still I still toured, but you know not as much because not a lot of plays were open, and I got um, the doing Zoom and like it's so much easier to get guests over a Zoom than to try to get them. I, I think it's better in a studio, but it's way easier to do it over Zoom. So I was able to get more of that, and then uh, you know, people wanted to watch stuff, so that worked out. Making videos, me and Kyle Dunnigan made a. Uh, uh, it's called the Fresh Prez. It's like a Biden sitcom. He does impressions with uh, face swaps. He had like his big oh, yeah, I've seen those, yeah. Yeah, so we made like, we started making a show. I mean, that actually like worked way better. So any kind of internet stuff. And I, I remember there was like, like people became like Clubhouse hit comics for a minute, which I don't even know what Clubhouse. I forgot about Clubhouse, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot about, yeah. Yeah, that was hot for a minute. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'll tell you what's funny, because, uh, a lot. Every, I don't have a car out here but since I moved because I live kind of close to the comedy where I go and I take Lyft or whatever. And a lot of the drivers are either from like Iran or like an African, but a lot of them are Jimmy Dore fans or because I always end up chatting with them kind of if they're from like somewhere kind of far. And uh, 
if you know anything, if you know anything, they are like, oh, <laughs> they really like it. And I was like, uh, some Iranian driver, I, he brought up something about where the car he goes, you know what, uh, America, how Iran got like that, right? Like he kind of, and he, and he, so I, he said, you know, all this stuff where he did, uh, well, you're welcome. <laughs> we started laughing and uh, we started talking and he was like, you should go on a uh, clubhouse because you'd be popular with the, so now it just moved to more of a blue collar thing. It, it's not that it's not around. It's just like, it's like drivers. It, there's actually probably whole markets on there of people that are still in clubhouse. Wow. We should That's do it, really Aaron. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, one more thing. One we're thing, we're yeah. on we call do, in we already. We do call in, yeah. 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 Uh, what's call in? I never even heard of that. Call in is a show. I mean, it's an app. It's free. And it's like you call in. It's it's kind of like they're trying to do a radio show, but on, on, the, on your phone. So oh, really? You, yeah. So you get to interact with your listeners or viewers. So we'll do ours right after this thing that we do Monday morning, which is a live stream that we do. And right after we go into call in and then we basically take questions and comments. Oh, and I didn't even like know about touch that. The, you, there's a cue and you just like touch the, the, the face of the person that you want to call on next. And yeah. Oh, you can see their face. Well, or, they're, av- and, they're yeah, whatever they avatar. choose. Sometimes it's like a dog or, or it's like Howard Zinn. Or uh, <laughs> Yanis Varoufakis is one of them. Right. Yeah, that, yeah that's Looking pretty dude. cool. I didn't know yeah. that had anything like that. That really, yeah. uh, do you remember, you reminds me of the call-ins when I was a kid living, I, was, I grew up in New Jersey mostly, but like AM talk radio back then, the call-in shows, like remember Bob Grant, that really conservative AM talk show host, and he was like angry, like people would call in, he would even yell at people that agreed with him. He would go, get off my phone. <laughs> He was he was a cl- and he was like so conservative on everything except prostitution. He felt strongly oh, really? should be legal. <laughs> right. I wonder why. I'm sure it's because he's committed to sex work liberation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he he did. He had some sex work. I'm talking about. She's like, now if I were to give you a release with a gloved hand, that shouldn't be a crime. He goes, well, I don't see why it should be. Right. <laughs> yeah, he, Bob Graham was referring. He used to be on talk show like when Rush Limbaugh was getting big. I guess they were on the same. They were like back to back. Chris Rock has a joke about that. Chris Rock is he's where he's like you know fiscally I'm a conservative but prostitution I'm a liberal. Oh really? But oh I forgot. You know I might know. Yeah, I'm butchering it. I'm sure, but you know as long those lines. So the clubs did shut down though during the pandemic originally. I I mean, Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering what you know what you did early on and 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 what your friends did because you know that's where stand up comedy lives is in, is in clubs and in front of live well they did so. okay the comedy store here they did um like the there's an outside patio and you can see a right. big window so we went and uh, stood in there okay. like a amsterdam hooker and <laughs> the light and, and they sat outside but the crowd was good i mean the crowd was pretty cool about it and they were you know they'd be in like a parking lot or something right because you're in get, la which was so different from being in new york i see because okay. you yeah and I, so i don't know how right. yo you were in new york the whole time yeah but was the part where you couldn't go to any places, how long did that last? I don't, like now it's, I remember that as being just a part of the whole, like what I would call, like mask time. I remember we could go out, but mask, mask went longer than that, if so, like here. I guess with LA, you had the outdoor option and that right. made it more difference. manageable for you. But here it's like, I didn't see comedy for at least, I feel like a year um, in, a, in a club. Maybe it was, it might've been. Yeah. 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 And touring, I mean, uh, uh, touring didn't slow down at all? Depends what state. So yeah. I, at the beginning, I remember I went to Florida and I and I was wearing a mask just out of like, I don't know, I didn't like COVID. I was, I had a, I smoked a long time <laughs> and I was like, all right. so I had a mask. I'm in Florida and like, oh my God, they couldn't have. And here's the thing I realized right away in the beginning is it's all depends on where the high concentration of people are that drink a lot. Cause they're all like, I want to get right. back to the bar. We're gonna die of something. They were already trying to die <laughs> of right. alcohol. Like we're gonna live forever. Right. So in uh, Arizona, I think that was like that. People were like, what are you? Come on! And then Florida was like that. Now I'm like, well, I must have just been nervous because all these. I can't believe how. I'm shocked at how like frightened I was like in the beginning to like this is like really. Uh, you know what reminds me of now is like when I went to China and so like 2016 or so. I was like, this is going to be the future. It was just all really like high tech, urban, very pol- like sci fi polluted in the air and um, packed. And everyone's Chinese. And uh, some people wore a mask 
or we're just going to wear a mask forever. You know, because after Bird Flu, like, you know what? I think I like this mask. And I remember being like, oh, look, they just wear masks all the time. And the air was so bad anyway. I don't even know. <laughs> like, you probably should wear, like, some other kind of thing. Like, a, like a, there was, like, not a chemical suit, some kind of suit in, in the hotel drawer for if it was a bad air quality day. Wow. And um, I was in Shanghai, which is very, it almost looks like, like by where the cellar is in New York in the village. I mean, Shanghai, where I stayed, it looked like, I don't know, part of New York City. It was, it, mm. I couldn't find any Chinese stuff. It was all like kind of American, com- and it was Christmas, I think. So Christmas was very popular there, there at the time. I don't know, it like really took off. And uh, I was like, there's gonna be a future. There's gonna be like, some people gonna have masks. It's gonna be like, you can make whatever jokes you want. They, what tell me, you can joke about whatever you want or any government you want, just not the Chinese government. Um, and I was like, all right, fair enough. I don't know anything about it, so fair enough. Right. And uh, when I got back, I started noticing all this stuff. I'm like, oh, we're like really similar. I don't know why they even talk about China as a, what do you want to be like China? I'm like, I don't, I don't think you realize how much we're like China. Already, yeah. So yeah. what were you doing in China? Uh, the Kung Fu Comedy Tour, which was, uh, they've banned stand-up now, you know, because things are all, but uh, right. they, the, lo- the comics from there, I was surprised how good they were. Like, uh, I thought it'd be some kind of bizarre culture thing you know like but they they get streaming and stuff and vpns and so they they're very familiar with lots of comedy i was like super surprised by that like how decent the from and I, everybody gives you like you know everybody has like an american name when you meet them so you they got like three names like one they tell you and then so but this comic storm was really funny storm shoe his name was but i think no one's allowed to do it now i think it's done and so you went there and you were performing with other like foreign comics or you were performing. Yeah, with a lot of expat. It's a lot of expat shows. I think it was actually I think it was illegal at the time now. So they had it got very popular and they told me actual stand up came from, you know, like out of vaudeville and a big part of it is from some traditional Chinese thing. Oh, wow. And they told me the name I forgot, but it means crosstalk and it's like a Abbott and Costello kind of routine like a who's on first that's like the an old old and so that kind of got in through vaudeville and i don't know this is what told me but uh the the audience are mostly expat um and then like chinese people spoke english you know a lot of chinese people speak english and then we uh we, we weren't allowed to perform because somebody had gotten jealous before i got like another bar it's it's by the way i didn't see anything resembling anything like communism the entire time i was there i saw nothing when people say communist china I was like, what are you looking at? Because I, it was almost like an 80s movie. The level of like materialistic, almost like ridiculous. I don't know how to describe it. It was just so, I'm like, oh, wow. Like people would wear like stuff with big price tags hanging off it. Like Minnie Pearl used to have on her hat, you know? And it would be like all counter. This, this girl in front of me at the hotel is wearing this like ridiculous like jacket that says Ed Hart. It's clearly counterfeit Ed Hardy. And it has this price tag of like, I don't, I don't remember what it was in you want one or whatever, but it, it's very much like that. Like, it's really like, like hustle, you know, all the time. And in every like dirty trick you would do to somebody is like almost fair game in, if you're trying to make some money. So the bar got jealous because standup was popular. So they went to the local, I think it's the interior ministry, like the one you have to worry about. And they said they're spreading anti-communist propaganda at this thing. And so the guys who run it, they both have Chinese wives and they speak Mandarin and they have connections and they knew people at that office. So they weren't worried that they were going again. The person like, we know you're not doing that, but because someone reported it, you have to not put on the show for a couple months because it's like the, how we, you know, because we look, but they're like, we're not, we, we believe, we you know, it's probably a jealous thing, but somebody reported it. So that means you have to, so they put a, had put a ban on it before I got there. So all they did to get around that was an email list. So people on the email list would go to the show. It, it's a, it seems like um, there's a lot of like scary sounding laws there, but it's at their discretion if and when they feel like enforcing them. It's like a, that's how I describe it. It's almost like a terms of services for a tech platform. <laughs> like right. at our discretion, we will just uh, arbitrarily do this, even though we don't usually enforce it. Like it's set up like that. It's like communist casual, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And communist if you're not guy. Chinese, they don't bother with you unless you have a dispute with someone Chinese, in which case you lose. So never. I re- We ran from the cops on the second day I got there. Me and the guy that ran the show. The cops there are not, not, not material ministry, but the cop cops are not, nobody respects them. People just, they're rich enough. And a lot of people are rich. They'll, they'll drive by giving them the finger out of their <laughs> Jaguar. Wow. They don't get, they're not armed. 
<laughs> Andy gets out of, we were pulling out of a hotel parking lot that had a toll gate on it for some reason. And, you know, I guess he, the guy was trying to like get money out of him, even though we we're, he was entitled park there and Andy's Australian. So I didn't realize they were fighting for a minute, him and this toll booth guy. Cause they have those cheerful, like no worries that accent. So I, I think he's telling the guy a joke, <laughs> but they're actually, they're yelling. And then Andy goes over to the toll booth thing. The, the partition starts trying to break it. And I'm like, what is happening? And then I buy a neck pillow on my neck and uh, like, <laughs> I just gotta, so maybe it's the first day. He, so he gets off, he walks around the car, he goes, we got to leave. The guy called the cops. I'm like, what? So I had to jump out and get my bag. So I ran with him with a rolly bag and my stupid neck pillow and for like a, like two blocks. And then he was like, okay, we're safe. Was the neck pillow not around your neck while you were running? Yeah. Oh, that's right. I put it around my neck because I couldn't carry it. Okay. So I wasn't wearing it, but I, it was so awkward running away. And, I, and, and then he explained the whole deal of how it works to me. And I guess he had been hit. Some guy, because you might get like racist attack, depending on what the political climate is. You know, it's it's a little different than racism here. It's more like like no offense, you're just not Chinese, so I, right. no one cares about you really. But it also could be like take out your your frustration, I guess. So this guy drove a moped into him on the sidewalk and knocked him down. And he goes, "What are you doing?" And then you know he's in an argument, and a cop comes up and he tells the cop what happened. And then the cop goes to the guy, do you want this foreigner to give you money? And he said he had to run away. And he ran away two blocks or something and hid in a bush, he said. And he saw that somebody had, there was like a human dump next to him where he thought, was like, did somebody else have to hide here for a long time? A human early. dump like a piece of shit, like a shit? Yeah. It uh, wasn't out. It wasn't like in San Francisco, open face right, style. Right. It was oh, behind a bush. Face. But, <laughs> but uh, anyway. I, I don't know if you guys swear on here, so that's why I was, yeah, yeah. I was fine, yeah. uh, using my awkward euphemism. I just think it's, I, I like, I think well, it's, I liked it because I thought maybe it was a dump truck or like a dump. I didn't know what dump, kind of dump it was, but yeah, I, I get it. Can I curse on here? Because yeah, I don't yeah, want to yeah. say dump. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, it took a huge shit. Sorry. Yeah. So but it feels much more comfortable. Anyway, yeah. he explained to me like the cops, they don't, what you have to worry about is if like the ones that the, in, I think it's interior ministry. I think it's what's called or culture ministry or something. It's some kind of ministry. That's who you would be in big trouble with if uh, they were called on you. As opposed to just like the local cops. Yeah. Even the prisons there. Cause some comic, I don't know who, I never met him, but some comic from America got arrested for like robbing some lady or mugging her, which was like the craziest thing. And um, the way they put it, the prison for that is not as bad as like, let's say you're the guy like, you know, Xi Jinping put somebody in prison. They were telling me from before I got there, like, if you're high up in the government and go, that's a much worse, like, breaking rocks prison. I mean, yeah. I'll, a few things where I'm like, I don't think that's so bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I, I say we try some of that, out, some of that out here. People are not afraid of the cops because they're yeah, unarmed. That like sounds that. great. Check. Unless, yeah, unless we'll jail some high level officials. Let's do it. Yeah. 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 Well, that's a, uh, that was a thing where I was like, I mean, that's, it was not like here. <laughs> I was like, like, I don't know if we're going to get the, like at least that out of it, you know, out of becoming China. Right. I bet well, you we, we won't. Become China, right. Yeah. right. Our elites, our elites always get us scot free. That's, that's the, well, American you know what guarantee. it does do? It does create a situation where the stakes are a lot higher to cover up your crimes if oh. then. And the whole thing runs on like, like a mafia th like i mean it's you know you got to know an official and do a thing and so there's a whole levels of like patronage and stuff that you know so then then there could be like crazier things happen when you hear about like certain this is something they told me there about the the guy who i don't know what the last guy's name was before xi jinping but everybody that i talked to we I'm saying like three people i didn't talk about their leaders to all of them but they from what i understand that he was more kind of liked a little bit than xi jinping unless uh and this is they're not mad at america at this point you know so i imagine if they're riled if they get riled up that they can come together pretty quick to be like we don't you know anyway so uh yeah. they had a twitter they had their own twitter because uh i don't know if it's what they have their own like kind of facebook that they were using that was like kind of better than facebook and that everybody was on and um their twitter somebody some i don't remember where this was or what province but the monorail they had this great monorail that you get three hour trip and you know, the city is like three New York city size cities next to each other. You'll go, that would take you three hours and it's like a half hour on this thing, but somewhere the, the whoever the guy in charge was really corrupt and it was poor 
you know, it was like poorly made, like the New Orleans dam kind of thing. And the train, they had a terrible accident. And um, the train was toppled over and they showed up and uh, dug a hole and plopped it in. And there were some people still on it. No. And the only reason anybody knew at all, nobody would know, but that Twitter they had, their own Chinese Twitter, people talked about it. And that was the end of that Chinese Twitter. So that's the kind of thing is like, nobody can find out about this, that I'm corrupt or I'm dead. Like that's the kind of, it's interesting. I don't know the after effects of that. It's just interesting what happens that it just creates real high stakes for powerful people that you may have to do something crazy, like that you may not have to do when they get off later, I guess is, is what I noticed. Yeah. yeah. You know, China has executed uh, billionaires. Yeah. And they get uh, shot in the head. Top, top bankers. I mean, you know, we don't have that here. That's for sure. So, you know, uh, but we pros and the cons. Penalty. Yeah, we do yeah uh, it is like pros and cons because I, I, you know, the 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 disappearing for a month billionaire and he comes back and shuts his trap thing. I was like, oh, don't make me love you, China. But it's it's you could see. I, I always am interested to see like the what you get from the different rules, like the pros and cons of it. So as far as I can see, that was the con, the only con of the severe penalties for people on top is they seemed a little more ruthless if something they had to cover right, something yeah. up. Right. And I thought we were pretty ruthless, you know? <laughs> well, in the land of the free, we don't need to cover it up because nothing bad is ever going to happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's got to be a happy medium between the, yeah. the shot in the head and that. Yeah, no, you're right. It really is amazing where you're like, oh, it is a lot of freedom. As long as you've got enough money, there's plenty of freedom yeah. here that you don't have there. Yeah. You don't have to pay fines. You can have really unsafe minds. You know, people die in it. Well, what's the point of being a billionaire? Like, right. So I was watching somebody's video brought this up. Like, there's really not a big difference between being a millionaire and a billionaire in China. Because, like, what do you get more? Once you got like a certain amount of money, like, what are you gonna spend it on? Like, just more like stuff made in China. Or, like, and what it is is, uh, you want influence. That's the whole point of the billionaire thing. So you can throw your weight around, and that's the thing that they ain't gonna let you do. So if you get just too big for your that the guy, the Alibaba guy was like, I think the last one I heard, right? That they grabbed. Did you ever see his big parties for? Where he's like a rock star. He's dressed like a rock star, like playing. And they all, it's like almost like a Jeff Bezos in his cowboy hat times right. 11 kind of. And uh, he did that too much. And they, they, he got, he disappeared. I had to go to shut up camp, I guess, for three, three months. Well, listen, speaking of uh, tech oligarchs and censorship, let's talk about how we do it here in the US. And I'm curious your reaction to Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. Recently admitting on the Joe Rogan show that Facebook suppressed stories about Hunter Biden's laptop after the FBI came to Facebook and said, look, all this might be a Russian right. influence campaign. How do you guys handle things when they're a, a big news item that's controversial? Like there was a lot of attention on Twitter during the election because of the Hunter Biden laptop story. The New yeah, York we Post. Have that too. Yeah. So you guys censored that as well? So we took a different path than Twitter. Um, I mean, basically, the background here is the FBI, I think, basically came to us, uh, some some folks on our team. It was like, hey, um, just so you know, like, you should be on high alert. There was the, – we, we thought that there was a lot of Russian propaganda in the 2016 election. We have it on notice that basically there's about to be some kind of dump of, of – um, uh, uh, that's similar to that. So just be vigilant. So – our protocol is different from Twitter's. What Twitter did is they said, you can't share this at all. Um, we didn't do that. What, what we do is we have, um, if something is reported to us as potentially um, misinformation, important misinformation, we, we also have this third-party fact-checking program because we don't want to be deciding what's true and false. And for the, I think it was five or seven days when it was basically being um, being determined whether it was false... Um, the distribution on Facebook was decreased, but people were still allowed to share it. So you could still share it. You could still consume it. So when um, you say the distribution is decreased, in, it, it got shared. It, how does that work? It basically, the ranking in newsfeed was a little bit less. So fewer people saw it than would have otherwise. So it definitely. By what percentage? I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's, it's, it's meaningful. Do you think Zuckerberg, that, that robot with salmon eyes do you think that he did that on purpose to kind of throw them and it wasn't my you know like do you think that was him uh kind of throwing them under the bus a little bit oh so he sold out the fbi well somebody I, else said i don't remember who i heard say it but i was like i wonder because he's got to be a ruthless like android and 
<laughs> like but that could be the thing because if you th- if i think about it, he he got hauled in for every not remember that stupid fake waste whistleblower that was like clearly a thing of yeah. of uh yeah and so he gets hauled in like what is he gonna do not do what they whatever they say to him to not go through that all the goddamn time you know so yeah. and what else can you and joe rogan and i love how rogan show is a place for that now where like that's mind-blowing to me i remember he started his podcast where i used to do it to, that would come to a point where like massive stories involving the government come out. That's crazy. And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to usefulidiots.substack.com. Anything you want to plug, anything you have coming up that uh, you want to tell people about? Oh, go to uh, Kurt Metzger Comedy. Kurt Metzger Comedy.com is uh, my dates coming up. I can't remember where, I, where I'm at. I'm in September. And then um, uh, Jimmy Door Show and Kyle Dunnigan Show. I don't know if you ever saw it, but we do a live one on uh, Thursdays. So we're coming back on Thursday. And um, I guess, oh, my Can't Get Right podcast that I've had Aaron on. Hey, well, Katie, would you come on it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was great. Thanks to Kurt Metzger for wow. uh, joining us. Yeah, we really wanted to make sure we had someone, uh, given the death of uh, Gorbachev, we wanted to make sure we had a real Soviet expert absolutely uh, join and, us, yeah yeah and if you if you missed us getting deep into gorbachev and the nuances of his life his complicated legacy that's just because you weren't paying attention right properly as kurt talked about the jehovah's witnesses and comedy in china there's yeah. the gorbachev insight was hidden in there yeah it was very very deep hidden yeah. very, and and in code yeah in fact i yeah. i missed it myself so mm. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. Well, all right. So useful it is uh, substack.com to get yeah, bonus honest. content. Full interview from this week. Bonus content every week. Extended interviews every week. What's not to love? Nothing. Absolutely There's nothing. Literally nothing not to love. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Bye. Hello, thank you so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For full episodes and extended interviews, please subscribe at usefulidiots.substack.com. You can subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash usefulidiots for clips, live streams, and full episodes. Also, subscribe to us wherever you find your podcast. Follow us on Twitter at usefulidiotpod and use the hashtag usefulidiotspod. Join us Mondays at 10 a.m. for the Useful Idiots Monday Morning Show where we discuss the Sunday morning news shows so you don't have to watch them. 